We're talking about containers and regulated environments. It can be kind of a boring topic. Um, I know every time someone um, thinks of regulated environments, they think of bureaucracy, uh, it can be really, really frustrating. Um, but today, I, um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll have um, just a nice, friendly overview of some of the mental models that will help you be successful with using some of the, the amazing tools that have come out in the last couple of years. Um, some people are talking about those tools here. So uh, in, the other, in the other room, Jeff just gave an amazing talk on Vault. And then tomorrow, there's a talk on Claire. We'll talk about a bunch of other um, tools as well. So we'll kind of split up into three phases. First, we'll talk about some concepts and mental models that are helpful when you're trying to survive in a regulated environment. Um, and then we'll talk about containers um, as a virtualization technology, and then as a packaging and deployment technology. And a lot of times when people are expressing concern or doubt about using containers, they're actually asking a much more specific question in one of those categories. And so it can, rather than having a big giant free-for-all debating whether or not yes or no can you use it, it's, it's helpful to break down to that and solve one problem at a time. So can I use containers? Um, are you, are, people are usually asking a much more specific question, right? Can I use this particular container engine? Can, what, what operating system should I use? Um, what scheduler should I use? Which hosting provider should I use? Um, and the answer to that is different for each um, set of regulations that you're facing. But ultimately, the answer is always yes. You can use any kind of, contain, any kind of technology with any kind of regulated environment. Um, you can use pencil and paper for, in a healthcare environment, right? You can use database technology from the 60s. You can use mobile phones. Um, any technology that we come up with, you will be able to make it work in a regulated environment. The real question is, if I'm going to use this technology, how does it affect my controls? Does it strengthen them? Does it weaken them? Does it require completely new controls? Um, and so what are controls? So examples of a technical, con technical control would be um, you must use encryption when transmitting data. Uh, you must authenticate users before giving them data. Uh, you must have roles that define which data can be accessed. Those are technical controls. Those are usually like well within the realm of developers and application designers. Um, and those are the sorts of things you're used to thinking about. Uh, administrative controls are the sorts of things we usually lump in the category of bureaucracy, right? Um, firewall logs being reviewed, uh, a requirement to screen personnel before you hire them, conducting background checks, monitoring your service providers and vendors, and um, checking their compliance status. So given any set of controls, some technology is a really good and natural fit, and some technology is more a, a tougher fit. Containers, containers are getting there. Um, they're obviously here to stay. And the state of the world today with containers is looking pretty good. But you know, as soon as you start talking about controls, you run smack into people problems. So the first one is ignorance. It's kind of sad. It happens at all levels. Um, either people not knowing what the rules are, and, and a lot of times that's uh, us in this room who are more technical and prefer to put our head in the sand uh, and not read about a, a big, giant, boring list of rules, or um, the people making the rules not knowing how the technology works. So it happens at all levels, the lawmakers, managers, regulators, auditors, technologists. I, I regularly talk to um, and hear about companies who are breaking the rules because of pure ignorance. So a couple of weeks ago, I talked to someone. They were processing healthcare data, storing it in um, Amazon RDS Postgres, and they completely didn't know that the contract they had signed with Amazon excludes Postgres from storing healthcare data in, in RDS. Um, that's their current exclusion. Now, they're trying to change that, but the company was just completely breaking the rules and doing something illegal purely out of ignorance. Um, I, I was uh, recently at a regulated industry summit in New York and heard a terrifying story about a doctor doing drug research. They investigated one problem and then found out, um, completely not following any of the rules from, um, it's called CFR 2111, uh, but it's about accuracy, reliability, integrity, and authenticity of records, right? So basically, download some code and some data, do a bunch of smart work on it, but have no controls in place to assure that you haven't lied about the data, that you haven't tampered with anything. So at the end of the day, all of that research had to be thrown out. That it had to, they had to start over. And why do things like that happen? Because of this other problem, which is optimism bias. 
So um, maybe you're facing a set of regulations with a very new technology and it doesn't specifically address or account for a particular invention. So as of a couple of years ago, PCI 2 didn't really talk about um, these fancy new ways of doing client-side crypto with JavaScript and credit cards. And so people were like, ah, it doesn't apply to me, it doesn't apply to me, I don't have to do anything. Well, eventually it caught up and then uh, 2014 PCI 3 came out and specifically I started addressing some of those sloppy practices. You do actually still have to pay attention to some things. Um, another, another form of optimism bias is, is the sort of instinctual gut reaction that like, this regulation that I'm having to comply with is wasteful and nobody's checking anyway. And it's easy to get confused between waste and cost, right? Absolutely they have cost, but what, what are you getting for that cost? Generally, these regulations are intended as additional resilience, right? Protection against failures. Um, running load balancers and clusters is also wasteful, but we don't seem to have the same problem with doing that. Like, we like the properties we get from that. And so, usually if you're, if you're feeling like, oh, this is wasting money, um, you might not be thinking about the entire, the entire system. So this optimism bias, it's a nice trait of people. Um, it's probably crucial for the survival of humanity, right? My marriage is gonna work out. Uh, you know, my kids are gonna turn out all right. Uh, but, um, you know, assuming that insiders, the people working on the system, are just as honest as you are when you're, when you're implementing the system um, is, a, is a huge thing. If, if you think about, okay, well, the person who gets my job in two years, what if they are trying to do something bad? then the, the controls that you put in place that might have seemed wasteful suddenly have a very valuable purpose in preventing harm. And um, the, the last kind of people problem is a lack of systems thinking. And this is, this is sort of mentally exhausting and, um, and, and hard to do and it takes like years and years of, of um, actual, actively working on, on this to start thinking about systems that are not just a machine or a component or a, a software component or a particular um, role that a person is playing, but how the entire socio-technical thing works together, right? So um, you might think, and uh, I certainly did for a long time, if I take reliable thing A and reliable thing B and reliable thing C and I plug them all together, I have a reliable system. I have a safe system. That's not true at all. Safety and reliability are often in direct conflict, right? You can totally have um, a safe system that is not reliable, right? When the train stops running because there's something dangerous in the track instead of running it over, that train was not reliable, but it was safe. Um, and you have this tension in all, of, in all of these systems that we work with in regulated environments. And a lot of times our, our mental models will contribute when there's human errors involved in the systems. So it gets, it gets even more complex when you, when you start to th realize it's not just one person making a decision, it's not just one software algorithm making a particular decision, but the exchange of information between all of those working together as a group actually forms like a super brain, and that thing is driving towards different results and, and emergent properties come out of that. So one of those could be safety, another one could be disasters. Um, so Quick examples of group cognition. Um, you have a large ship and there's like a team of five to ten people who are actually steering and driving the ship, right? No one of those people actually knows all of the things that you have to do to steer the ship. They, don't, they can't hold all of that information in their head. So they're relaying information back and forth all of the time and that super brain between all of them is actually driving the ship. Another example is an engineering team, right? Any engineering team working on um, a product that, that runs over time and processes data, um, the exact sort of thing you might want to run in containers is actually functioning under those group cognition models. And so when you start thinking about things that way, it becomes so much more important to make sure that the way you design, you have to design things so that the right way to work is the easiest way to work, right? Because fatigue and this group cognition stuff and the, the limits on pe what people are able to actually hold in their head, if you don't make it that way, it, like, Things, things are going to fail, even if you've made every single individual piece totally, totally reliable. So um, the last thing to, that is important to understand is, is that there is a natural cycle between invention, regulation, and enforcement. And so don't be too frustrated when you see a time delay between technology availability and when regulations are actually updated to deal with it. 
sometimes what happens is the, the laws stay the same, but the, the interpretation and enforcement changes. Um, we've all lived through in our careers um, several examples of technology totally leapfrogging regulations, right? So the introduction of networks, the explosion of the web, um, the explosion of mobile phones. And just a quick example, in, um, in healthcare, in 2011, Joint Commission ruled that it's completely unacceptable for doctors to text orders about patient care, services, or treatment. You can't do it. That is prohibited. But in May 2016, they revised their position, right? Specifically allowing secure texting and describing the characteristics of a platform, right? So HIPAA, the laws haven't changed, but the understanding and interpretation of those laws to modern technology is, is updated frequently. And we talked before about PCI and the fancy JavaScript um, that you do with Stripe and Recurly and things like that. Um, the current PCI spec specifically talks about virtualization and addresses separating different roles um, in different virtualized containers from each other. For example, don't run a web container, a DB container, and a DNS container on the same service, on the same server. Um, there's a reference here to um, a paper. This is, this is um, plant-derived vaccines. So this is fascinating. They were trying to figure out, um, we want to build these vaccines and uh, it's going to take some time to discover them and then produce them and then distribute them. And then we have a population that we're trying to help with hepatitis B. Uh, so where do we build them? We, they had the luxury of looking at like, okay, there are different places in the world with different sets of regulations. Um, what, how do we pick and choose our research, production, and distribution to get the best results for the population? Um, and so they actually modeled out three totally different approaches and, and tried to calculate how that would affect helping that population. So the, the bottom line with, with the, your mental approach to it, it really needs to, to be do a good job, right? You, sometimes as technologists, we, we get this selective allergy to cost, right? I mentioned it before, like, oh, uh, this auditing code that I'm having to write is really, really just expensive. It's boring. It's taking me a lot of time. But don't do that. Be willing to invest the same amount of energy that you, know, you put into optimizing and debugging, inventing cool things. And more important than that, don't become so obsessed with like checking off the boxes of regulations that you lose sight of the big picture. So one example, um, again, from healthcare is uh, I've seen it again and again. People get so wrapped up with their obligation to safeguard privacy they completely forget the person who owns that data has the right to disclose it. And so they lock it all up in a strong box and the person can't get their own data and they can't share it with anybody because you've protected it. But you've lost sight of what the big, the big picture goal was. Um, some corporations use those same regulations to, um, they misapply them and try and justify anti-competitive behavior. We're not gonna share data with this other system because then you could provide them care more cheaply than what we're charging. Um, so, so keep in mind the big picture. Um, and why those regulations exist in the first place. So um, for, for those mental models, um, there, these are some excellent, excellent books that will just completely expand your mind how you think about this stuff. So the first one, Engineering a Safer World, um, Nancy Levison talks about safety and causality and presents a really nice systems model for safety. Um, and there's some just incredible analysis of some famous accidents and the, the entire socio-technical systems that were involved, right? Not just the things that we think about traditionally as root causes, but like the, the contributing factors, right? So like one big accident, a bunch of the people who were involved in the accident had been flown in less than eight hours before, right? And so you talk about, well, what was the accident? This operator didn't follow the rules. Well, why didn't that operator follow the rules? A bunch of people who didn't know each other were just, you know, flown in and stuck in a room together. Communication was poor. There were all these social angles as well. So. Engineering Safety World, that is an incredible book. It's a free PDF download if you um, go to that site. Um, the stuff on group cognition by Edwin Hutchins, that's where I got the example of the, the Navy ship. So we actually did field research on a Navy ship. Um, and it, it's just, it'll bring a smile to your face to, to realize how we are all like actually parts of this larger computer um, that are a, a weird sort of distributed system. Character of Harms is, is an interesting book also. Uh, I don't like it. But um, it, it comes from the legislator or regulator mindset. Um, and it specifically takes an adversarial approach focused on preventing harm or mitigating bad actions. 
And so that can really help snap you out of that optimism bias when you're thinking about how to design a system. Um, it, reading that will help you understand the mindset maybe of an auditor or a regulator. Um, and so it's useful to help understand other perspectives that are in play. Um, and the tempo book is, is also very, very good. It's about narrative-driven decision-making. What is the story that I want to be able to be told about the work that I was doing? And what's the end result that we're driving towards? So I have to imagine those sort of techniques are what was involved when vendors were building illegal technology, working with the Joint Chiefs to try and get the secure texting order um, changed, right? They understood the regulations. They understood the technology. They understood the lag between the rules and, and the invention. And they understood the end result that they could, could reach if they invented that technology and patiently took the time to educate everyone involved and really reassure that, yes, it was, it was safe to use. So that's the, um, that's the sort of hand wavy part. And then um, more specifically talking about um, containers first as a virtualization technology and then some of the things to think about um, with, de with um, packaging and deployment. I'm not going to recommend, you know, like any silver bullets here, any particular things that like, oh, you have to do it this way. Um, I will mention some of the, some of the tools that I have found um, impressive or interesting. Like I said at the beginning, you can use sort of any tools that you want and still achieve various regulations. You just have to be thinking about what, how, how am I going to deliver my controls given these sets of tools. So um, as a virtualization technology, it, one way to think about it, it's like running the containers versus building the containers. So we'll start off with talking about running the containers. Um, if there's one thing you read in this area, uh, it's this overview paper from NCC Group, which was published just in April. Uh, it's very, very readable. It covers Docker, um, LXC, Rocket. Um, it has very, very concrete, specific hardening recommendations for those three container engines. And it talks about um, a bunch of other things too, right? So managing security artifacts. For example, don't put passwords and keys in your source tree. Uh, I, I see this all the time. Um, even, even very simple things like that. Don't put passwords in your Docker files. The environment variables that were like all of the documentation encourages you to use for passing in secrets still carry a significant level of risk. Um, I was so happy to see um, Jeff talking about Vault because that is an amazing key management system that will, that will give you a much better um, level of security around, around all of the passwords and secrets that are in a container environment. So I'll, I'll, I will say you should be using Vault. So think about what the specific rules are for your environment. Um, are you required to have isolation from different types of containers, right? So if you're picking a scheduling system, you should be thinking about if I do have those requirements, um, am I, does my scheduling layer let me express those constraints and, and um, enforce them easily? Um, does my, what guarantees does my environment give me about isolation, right? So um, a very concrete example is in Amazon, in AWS. In order to be HIPAA compliant, you have to run on dedicated EC2 instances. You can totally run containers on top of those. But for example, you can't use Elastic Beanstalk because that doesn't give you uh, any option for running them on dedicated instances. So they don't provide the isolation guarantees. Um, it's really important to think about how you're going to update those host systems. Um, if, if you can at all, you should, you should use a distribution that was designed with container hosting in mind. So three of the really um, big ones right now are CoreOS, Rancher OS, and Atomic Host. I think there are folks from all three of those um, here. You should absolutely talk to them and understand uh, how much work they take off your plate with, with dealing with updates. Another super important area is securing the traffic to and from the containers. Um, once those things are up and running, they're no good unless they can actually exchange data. Um, do you have encryption in all of these places? What are the other services that are sort of unique to your environment that you, you might have forgotten about, right? You've encrypted to the database and to the load balancer because everybody has one of those. But what about the other special things that you're using? Um, and, and this uh, points to an area that is sort of terribly documented in the, in the industry, um, and that's um, using PKI or running a certificate authority internally, right? There's a bunch of very bad documentation for a bunch of very homemade tools. Um, but if you are actually going to start using encryption in all of these connections, you need a way to issue and manage those certificates. Um, 
And so that's another area where I'll say vault can be a, a CA and you should, you should totally use that. Um, it is so much better documented than the other things out there. Um, super important to think about logging. Do your logs contain protected info? I can't tell you how boring the conversation is about whether or not IP addresses are protected info. So I'll just point you to this. Um, there's an infographic here from the, from the um, future, future Freedom something organization. Um, they have this guide talking about different categories of de-identification and how a very, a very useful way of thinking about whether or not something is or may be um, information that needs to be protected. Um, after you look at that, you'll, you'll realize like, yeah, we actually do need to, to safeguard our logs a little bit better. Um, and you should think about whether or not your logging system provides support for automating um, detection of certain patterns or alerting on key events. That will actually dramatically cut down on the amount of work that you have to do to keep up with administrative controls that are required. So um, one of the examples of an administrative control was you need to check your firewall logs daily. Well, if the logging system that you're using can check for particular types of events and alert you, that actually meets the control so you don't have to have a person looking at logs every day and missing important things anyway. You can have a machine do some of that work. There are a ton of logging vendors out there. Um, you should be thinking about one that specifically um, promises to to uh, comply with this, with the regulations that you're having to cope with. Um, Sumo Logic is one that I use a lot, um, but there are a bunch. Um, containers change this world a lot: intrusion detection and monitoring. So if you if you are working in one of these environments, you probably have at least a part-time security team. Um, and if, if you're asking them to deal with containers, definitely make sure that they get the support to get some new tools that are container aware. Um, some, of the, some of the older tools are just, just too hard to use with containers. So a couple that stand out um, both for um, intrusion detection and monitoring are ThreatStack, uh, that's a Boston company. Um, also Sysdig just came out with this new thing called Falco. Um, Falco talks about itself as being a behavioral activity monitor with container support. That's a combination of Snort, or like a combination of Snort, OS second, and S-Trace. Um, so those are, those are two good options to look at. On the monitoring side, Datadog is great, and, and so is Sysdig Cloud. Both of those will give you a ton more information about a container environment than a traditional just uh, single uh, uh, host-based environment uh, tool would give you. Um, and you also need to be thinking about malware defense. This is, this is another area where um, we kind of do ourselves a disservice. Um, traditional antivirus is, is like constantly getting eye rolls and derision, not, not for no reason, because a, a lot of times um, like those traditional antivirus systems actually increase your attack surface or um, make you more vulnerable than not running them. But rather than just dismissing them or, or being bitter about it, think about how to make uh, a better choice. Don't just like not have malware defense. Put something better in place. Um, so for uh, an example of this is uh, yesterday Amazon published a really nice um, white paper reference architecture and um, spreadsheet um, for PCI DSS3. Uh, and it's, it's this great big spreadsheet completely mapping every single regulation with how those, requirement, those requirements are met. Um, and then the section on antivirus is completely blank, right? So now, to be fair to Amazon, it's a shared security model, and you are responsible for filling that in. But I know most people who go use that are going to just leave that blank and, and not implement it. There are better tools out there. Um, one that I really like right now is a Boston startup over in, in Wakefield called Strongarm. Uh, they actually use DNS to... Um, detect when malware is trying to phone home, right? So malware doesn't want to just run on this box by itself and not talk to anybody. They want to actually get data out. Um, and so uh, you can use DNS as a control point, a very, very effective control point. So you're running huge numbers of containers. Who knows what software in there? You don't need to be installing things in every single one of those. You can actually inject a DNS server into an entire VPC or other networking environment through the way you configure your, your DHCP and get a very nice uh, malware defense system that can immediately alert you if there's any malware on the network trying to get back out. So that's a, that's a bunch of areas to look at for um, packaging and deployment tools. 
Um, uh, uh, for, for running containers. And then now if we look at packaging and deployment, this is where uh, you start to involve typically a lot more people in your organization. A lot more people outside of your organization. A lot of people you've never even met. Um, and a lot of people who don't have the same motivation to follow the same security practices that you do in your regulated environment. So there's a, a nice blog post linked here um, from Scott McCarty talking about modeling the contents of your container as actually a supply chain. Um, that's a really useful way to look at it. And then um, most of us are using software that pulls in dependencies from open source systems, right? Uh, PyPy, RubyGems, um, any number of open source libraries. It's one of the, the great things about working on software today. Um, but how do you actually protect those community repositories? Uh, there's a very, very good um, model uh, and paper called Diplomat um, that's looking about how to protect those. So if, if someone who writes a popular library, um, their credentials get stolen and, that, and a, a malicious code gets pushed into that repository, how are you going to protect your code from accidentally pulling that in? Um, it's sort of the opposite problem of making sure that you're pulling in updates as soon as security updates are available in any of those things. Um, so to go along with that, once you've got this thing built, uh, a lot of folks are building scanning tools to help you stay on top of, okay, what, what is actually running out there in this, in this cloud of containers. Um, bunch of tools here. Um, the Red Hat uh, Atomic Scan one, um, it uses open SCAP by default, but it will let you plug in other scanners as well. Um, Docker Cloud just came out with security scanning. Uh, I think it's in beta right now. Uh, they've got a great uh, benchmarking tool to tell you whether or not you're meeting a bunch of the, the security recommendations. There's a talk tomorrow about Claire from CoreOS doing static vulnerability analysis inside. Um, there's someone here called Aqua, which I hadn't heard of before. So there's a, an explosion of helpful tools in this space to help you stay on top of actually being able to look at those containers and find out when one of them needs to be updated. That was not what I expected. That's my daughter. Um, once you've built those containers, you're going to need a place to put them. Um, so an important decision is to think about what, what uh, capabilities am I going to give myself or take away from myself by, ch by the choice of where to put the containers. It shouldn't just be whoever the first person was that got to work on the, the container prototype in your organization, whatever they were happening to use in the demo that they were trying, that's where all of your containers are. You need to really th think about where those are, um, where those are both from a um, cost and performance perspective, if you've got anything confidential inside those, um, um, and from an assurance perspective, right? Thinking about that su supply chain. So um, the big cloud vendors provide registries. Those are very convenient um, for giving you a nice way to authenticate and, and push stuff. Um, they don't have any of the scanning capabilities. So there's also um, specific commercial services. Uh, Key.io is from the CoreOS folks. It's integrated with, with Claire for scanning. Docker Cloud, also, if you pay for it, you can get, um, get the scanning. Um, VMware just published an open source one called Harbor. Uh, that doesn't have container scanning, but it does have some interesting things around um, auditing and role-based access control. So depending on exactly what you're, what you're trying to um, govern about the container lifecycle, what, what's going in there and what you're trying to protect, um, that might be an interesting option. Um, so that's, that was uh, container scanning kind of about um, the, the, the frameworks and application level, like below your application, right? Um, the libraries inside your container. But what about your app code? So thinking about that supply chain, you should totally be doing static analysis of your app code in your build pipeline. So a really, really um, nice and easy to use tool is Code, code Climate. Um, they support a bunch of the popular um, dynamic languages. They also are extensible, so there's a thing uh, called Code Climate Engines, and you can plug in um, all kinds of weird analyzers. Um, Black Duck is another one that's been around for a long time. Um, I think less interesting than, than Code Climate, but it, if there are particular types of um, um, 
license violations that you need to be looking out for. They're very useful. And then it's not just static analysis during container build. You can actually run um, interactive checks against your running code um, before you push it to production. So this is one of the really nice things about containers is you've got these polyglot applications written in who knows what language and you need to make sure that they're secure. Um, containers sort of give you a nice way to get a handle on those and you can take the one thing that you build, you know exactly what went into it and you can put it in different environments and run different checks against it. Um, Gauntlet is a really nice tool for doing that. So you can spin up an arbitrary um, web service, point Gauntlet at it, and it will test for um, some of the Mozilla secure coding standards. It will test some of the headers for you. Um, it will automatically detect some SQL injection stuff. So even if the static scanners don't know about the fancy new functional language that you're using, um, when you stand up that web service, there are still tools you can use to poke it that will detect some of the, some of the most common problems. Um, and, and sort of tying all of those pieces together, um, the biggest gift you can give to future you and to, to other people who might have to work on this environment after you've navigated all of these choices and trade-offs and, and uh, risks and everything is to, to document, right? So you, using containers is great because you, like, you, get, you get much more of a, by default, a recording of what changes actually happened in version control. But that's usually not enough to understand the reason why, right? You changed this obscure config setting. Um, you changed how you're publishing a password. But why? What was the specific thing you were trying to accomplish? Um, so if you create a document that maps the specific requirement to a particular design decision, it can be really, really simple. But having that mapping will let future people be able to be way less annoyed with the regulations. So instead of going like, oh, this is regulated stuff, we can't ever change it because you know seven years ago Joe um, made sure that we were compliant and, and so we just can't change the way we do our builds now. It's, it's impossible. Instead, they can say, oh, that was meeting this requirement. This requirement was revised two years after we made that decision and now we can use secure texting. Now we can do this. Now we can do that. Um, and you're going to just have a much more pleasant experience and not make life harder for yourself than it really has to be while you're staying compliant. Um, that, that spreadsheet from, from Amazon is a great example for PCI DSS. It's harder to find one for, um, for HIPAA. Uh, Amazon has also published them for um, oh, one of the NIST standards and it looks like they're going to be publishing a bunch more of these reference architectures which will just make it so much easier for people to, um, to educate themselves about this. So um, given all of that, if you are in a regulated environment and you have a million options um, and you want, to, you want to start introducing containers because you know, it's the right time in that life cycle, what are some good starting points? Um, these are four that I think are, are really, really solid. They give you lots of, lots of tools and support um, are not risky at all. So one would be Amazon's uh, container service you have to install those container service agents on dedicated instances, but once you do that, you can use the container service. Um, Microsoft actually is doing an amazing job with um, compliance of 15 or more regulations and adding new services all the time that are covered. So you can actually run Mesosphere um, DCOS on Azure and have a very secure environment um, that, and Microsoft gives you lots of support with meeting, meeting um, these different regulations. Microsoft actually publishes their BAA. Um, you can just download it from their website, unlike um, Google or, or Amazon. Um, Tectonic is a commercial distro of Kubernetes from CoreOS, the CoreOS folks. Um, you can run that on Amazon or on packet.net, so packet.net is on demand bare metal. If you run it on, on um, something like packet.net, you can actually get um, attestation um, secure compute from firmware signatures all the way up to the Kubernetes cluster members, right? So you can actually get a, a chain of verification all the way up. And uh, running signed containers with Rocket, you can have a very good compliance story there. Um, Google Cloud Platform also is pretty good. Um, they have a much shorter list of services that are actually approved for use in regulated environments. Um, I particularly, I was looking at healthcare yesterday. Um, so you can use Compute Engine and their database. Um, you can run Kubernetes in there. Uh, it's not quite as extensive as the list you can get from uh, Microsoft or, or Amazon, but 
but if it matches what you're trying to do, it's a, it's a good option. Um, one thing I will say with Google Cloud, it wasn't clear to me whether uh, they have a push button Kubernetes install, uh, so called Container Engine, and it wasn't I wasn't sure whether or not that is covered. Um, so if you are looking at that, it's worth taking a taking a closer look at it. So that is um, that is it. That is sort of the the whirlwind tour. Um, if you are working in a regulated environment, I would really, really love to meet you and, and hear about uh, you know, like what things you're struggling with. Um, I am very passionate about helping, like I, like I said at the beginning, uh, the right way to work should be the easiest way to work. I think the more we can do to talk about getting past these challenges and, and share the stories and come up with really smooth, easy ways to meet the regulations, uh, everybody will be better off. Uh, we have about we have about five minutes for questions, so please, guys, if you have any questions, uh, I'll pass on the mic, and you can ask the question. Josh? I actually wanted to plug some open source stuff. Um, in terms of uh, one other way to lock stuff down um, is to look at ways to actually decrease the privileges required for the container platform. Um, I mean, we have one project to do that called Bubble Wrap. There's other stuff out there I know Jesse Frizzell has been working on an unprivileged container runtime. Um, so I think you need to see that more as people do this in regulatory compliance things. I sure hope so. I, I kind of think it would be fascinating to take some of that technology and glue it to the serverless stuff. Right now you can't, you can't really use serverless yet, but that would be an amazing combination. That's it? There's one here. Uh, what are you? Sorry. Excuse me. Here you go. Uh, I was just wondering how um, the different cloud services are dealing with compliance requirements for European countries. That, so that's a great point. I don't know how um, I don't know how Amazon and Microsoft are doing. Sorry, how Google and and Microsoft are doing it. But I know um, with Amazon specifically, that's one of the great things about regions. Um, and so you, you can actually select where you're deploying um, your software based on a region that lives within that regulatory zone, right? So I've, I've worked with one company that um, had customers in the U.S., right? And so they had to deploy one cluster in one of the U.S. regions. And then they also had customers in Germany and across the EU. And so by putting stuff in um, one of the EU regions, it actually, it, so they had a, def, um, a technical control in their application was this customer signs in, are they an EU regulation customer, are they a US regulation customer, and put their data in the right database. But you can totally do it. I'm curious, at the beginning you had uh, technical controls and then administrative controls, and my question is around administrative controls where a lot of the time auditors that are third party like KPMG come in. They know all about the administrative controls and policy, et cetera, and they have a really hard time understanding how that connects to the technical controls. What are you are you seeing a shift and they're becoming more educated? Because I'm still coming across people that are still very uneducated in that space and it proves very difficult. And what happens is that it the auditing process gets dragged out for an, a long period of time because they're getting up to speed. Yeah, so it's still a problem. I think it will always be a problem. Um, there's several things that we can do. One is, by if, if we're a technical person, by educating ourselves more about the point of the, of the regulations, we'll be able to do a much better job telling the story about how the system we've designed meets those requirements. Um, and so we, we can help educate them. There's also like this, uh, generational might be too big of a period of time, but there's this thing that happens, right, where people change jobs. And so just because, the auditor that you happen to meet today doesn't understand it. Um, there's been a big shift in the, the life sciences area, um, CFR 2111 stuff, where there, the laws haven't changed in 20 years. But within the last, um, the last 16, 18 months, all of a sudden loopholes that companies were getting away with all the time, it's like no, no, no more. We, we have hired people in the last five years who understand how, how the modern technology works, and that's totally not okay that you're doing that. Or it totally is okay that you're doing that. Sorry, so the example from Joint Chiefs um, giving permission on secure texting and enumerating the specific capabilities of secure texting. So if you if you meet a, a particular 
technology and a particular auditor who doesn't understand that technology, that's really the ignorance thing. And, and it takes work on both sides to like think about what, what's the, the protection you're actually trying to put in place. And you can usually come up with a justification. What they're not going to do is let you get away with saying, we don't have to do that because I'm smart and I'm a developer and you don't understand technology. Like, like the, we were talking about with the malware stuff. 